Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll talk about the foster care system with special guests, Becky Davenport, Executive Director of Bloomar Youth in Fayetteville, Georgia, Melanie Sheets, Executive Director of the Foster and Adoptive Care Coalition in St. Louis, Missouri, and Don Wells, Missouri uh, native and Chief Empowerment Officer of Just in Time for Foster Youth in San Diego, California. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's just wonderful to, to uh, see you all. And National Foster Care Month begins in just four days. So it's a particularly appropriate time to look at the foster care system. We have 400 to 460,000 children. It's almost half a million children in, foster, in the foster care system. Uh, aged uh, infant to, uh, uh, to 21 with an average age of eight years old. So let's talk about what's worked and what's not. And, and Becky, let's start with you. Um, what can we do going forward? Um, and, and what have we done uh, to take care of youth who really require the support of adults um, you know, for, for all of our independence and all of our individualism, children need help of adults. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what you're doing in Fayetteville and how you see the problem from your angle? Absolutely. Um, I, uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be on the show. This is quite an honor. Um, I know one of the things that we do at Bloom is to keep the child, to keep a child centric, everything we do is around the betterment of the child. Um, we've been the Atlanta metro area just south of Atlanta for the last 32 years and we're a licensed foster care agency. Um, we started out running two residential group homes um, back in the day when that was um, what we did with children in foster care. Um, but our mission has always continued to be the same, which is to strengthen children in foster care and empower the families who care for them. Um, we have three programs to that effect. We have our foster parenting pro program where we go out and we recruit, train, and support families to take in therapeutic children, medically fragile foster children, and um, foster parenting teen girls who um, are in need of support and, and a place to live. So we also have a program called the Bloom Closet, which is a free clothing resource for every foster child in the state of Georgia. And that program has been so key to involving the community who can't be foster parents in, in a very tangible way through the donation of gently used clothing, diapers, baby gear, not gently used diapers, but we, we have a whole realm of things that we give away for free to foster children. And it's in the setting of this very fun and uh, brightly decorated store. So um, that's been a great way for our, our organization to plug the needs of the community um, and to, um, to, to plug foster um, children and make that front and center for um, people in our community. But I think one of the key things is that is to keep um, if I'm a child in foster care and we're keeping that child's uh, best interest um, front and center, the uh, placement of first choice for me as a foster child would be with a relative. If no one is identified in the family unit to take that child, the next best place is someone familiar to that child, say a neighbor or a teacher. And that's what we call fictive kinship in Georgia. And then... Um, and then of course, on, in the third line, it's the, the foster home. Um, it's, it's a non-relative placement, but the key to a successful outcome for placing a child into foster home is matching. So that when we find a specific foster family that is matched to that child's individual needs, um, that family won't be freaked out by those needs and they'll know how to respond. And, and they'll respect that child's culture and the way he or she was raised. So there, so, are, there are a couple of themes that are that emerge here, right? It starts off with the child. Absolutely. Right? It starts off with the child. There's a theme that you mentioned of respect, right? Of basically respecting the the the, the foster parents, the the young people. Right. Yes. Of, it's, of it's, trying to equal the playing field of creating environments that are welcoming. Right. 
Yes, to um, to restore their dignity. I think when children are placed into foster care, they lose their sense of identity and they have sort of a less than um, that comes over them. Their self-esteem is lowered. They have that, that um, this, the brand over their head that I'm a foster child. And so it's restoring that child's sense of dignity and their sense of normalcy so that they can do things just like their peers can, that they they can get the help that they need um, for the issues that they're facing, that um, everything is centered around bettering the life of the child while they're in foster care. And Melanie, when, when um, children come into you, could you talk a little bit about how you do your intake and, and what kind of programs you offer uh, well, over in St. Louis? Sure, and, and Becky, thank you. I appreciate everything that you've said, and I think that, that we can all agree upon that the state is a terrible parent to raise children, and what we do not want is for children to remain in foster care for a long time. You know, kids come into foster care because abuse, neglect, abandonment, but then this is national. I mean, the, the vast majority of children come in to care for neglect, not because of abuse. And so the question, first of all, is should this child even have come into the foster care system? And that's really where we're getting as the child welfare um, in child welfare nationally. Um, we know that too many children come into foster care. You know, being poor is not a reason why a child should enter foster care. Being black is not a reason why a child should enter foster care or Latinx. And we have too many children, especially in, in St. Louis, who are African American who enter foster care simply because um, because of racial inequity? So that's so when I hear Becky talk about making sure children are placed with relatives and kin. Exactly right. We want to keep that identity for a child. We we can't have better cultural competence than a child's family of origin. And so, um, and full disclosure, my husband and I are, are adoptive parents to two children, my husband's also Caucasian, to two African-American children, they're now adults. And as we got to know their family over time, there would have been plenty of beautiful family members who could have kept our children within their family of origin. So we created a program called 30 Days to Family um, in which we identify 150 of a child's relatives when they first come into foster care. And certainly, if you can identify 150 relatives, you're going to find a safe, appropriate place for a child to live. And when a child is placed with a relative, their chance of getting out of foster care is so much faster otherwise. If not, our kids get stuck, right? And can bounce from home to home, can end up in long-term residential care, just like Becky was talking about. And what we don't want is we don't want kids to get to the point of where they're getting ready to age out. And I know Don has lots of information to share with us about that, I would assume, just looking up a little bit about your organization. The last thing that I wanted to state is the next 10 years, in my opinion, of where we're going as an industry is what Becky also mentioned, and that is treatment foster care. Our children are highly traumatized before they come into foster care. And then just being the fact of being removed from your family of origin just adds to that trauma. And so our children need and deserve highly trained and supportive foster homes. I mean, some can be at a traditional level, right? But some need that, that uh, higher level of support. And so Becky mentioned treatment foster care. Sometimes it's known as therapeutic foster care. Um, and especially with some new federal laws that have come out making sure that our children are not being placed indefinitely into residential care, but instead can be placed in the community with that support. So that's kind of a, a, a lens of where we're going. So you're, you're unpacking so much. We're gonna come back to some of those points. Don, uh, I'd like to give you a bite of the apple as well, because your organization really does take a particular cut at this, at this, uh, at this issue. Could you just describe uh, how you see um, what Melanie and Becky were describing in your part of America. Thanks. <clears throat> and I certainly agree with what they're saying. Um, just in time for foster youth uh, actually serves young people from 18 until they turn 27 who come out of the foster care system. And part of what we try to do is make sure that that generational cycle of foster care doesn't happen, that we break that cycle with young people who've experienced the, the trauma and the lack of consistency and the lack of support that has been described by Becky 
and Melanie, that's that's part of the problem. And at the heart of what we do is we we believe, and I think this reflects what they've said too. Uh, people don't do well in systems; they do well in communities. I mean, if I ask you, do you want to be part of the education system or the or an education community? You would pick the community. The same thing with healthcare system or healthcare community. You pick the community. Systems are sort of set up to do what they do, and then we people have to sort of fit into that system. Communities are owned by the people in the community and they help create that community. And so it's it's more likely to serve their, their needs. So even with what we do, we, we have now about 30, 37 staff members, 60% of them are former foster youth. So they help design everything we do. When somebody comes in to get services, they're met by somebody who has had that experience. They understand the trauma that has been mentioned uh, and, and that, that trauma is extensive. We, there's a uh, adverse childhood experiences scale that goes from one to 10. And if you have, uh, if you're at, at a four, you have all these uh, physical, mental, emotional issues that, that are there for you. If you have six, then your life expectancy is less by about 20 years. And when we surveyed our participants, it was eight to 10, everybody. So, so that's an urgent need and that's why the, the treatment is so necessary. But central to all of this is relationships, consistent relationships. You can provide all kinds of resources to people, but if relationships are not there, if they don't have a sense of belonging, if they don't think that they have somebody who cares for them, those resources don't make any difference. And, and I'm also, I also like to say that changing the way we think about this, for me, we will have reached where we are where we need to be if we don't talk about placing people anymore. You don't want to place people. We, uh, somebody used the word of matching or connection. You want to do that for, for children, to place them. And the, the young people we work with, they always talk about that feeling of, of being placed. I don't have any say in it. I'm just sort of being put someplace and I'm put someplace else and I'm put someplace else. And that's not good for children to, to feel like they they're just being moved around which is why you do want to try to, to, to create that consistency. If somebody's removed from their family, what they're missing then is family. And so you have to, you have to make sure that that happens either with the family they came from or some other more consistent connection. It strikes me that, that this idea of listening, listening to the young person, no matter what their age is, and certainly as they get older and they become more capable of, of describing what they've experienced in the past, and then changing your approach in response to that listening is so embedded into in what you're all saying. Um, can we talk a little bit about um, this, this idea of providing, providing these services while keeping children safe and respecting their input? Um, how do you strike that balance? Don, if you, if you could talk a little bit more about, about that idea of, you know, you've got youth Safety is so important, uh, particularly dealing with people who are traumatized, who might also be a danger to themselves. Um, how do you ensure that there is, there is safety, there's an adjustment in your program based on input? Um, and, and, and how do you make sure that your organization remains vital as times are changing and as you, the needs of your youth are changing? So for me, the central question is what is, in the best interest of that child in terms of their total well-being. Mm -hmm. I think that there's, there, in working with child welfare over the years, safety became like the, the premier thing, but there's so many other things that are also essential along with safety. You can, you can keep somebody safe by putting them in a box, right. but that's not good for their well-being. You can keep somebody safe without helping them to get to the next level of where they need to be. And, and my framework is, what would you want for your own children? That's the standard you should have for children once they, they come into your care. Would you, would you have your children go from one placement to another? Would you have your own children being removed from your family completely? I mean, that's, that's sort of the idea. And then you, you take that sensibility and you do individualize it for that young person. So safety is absolutely... Uh, uh, a priority, just like the safety of your own children is a priority, but there are other things that need to happen too. 
and, and the, the safety focus as a primary thing almost gets them to be a liability thing as opposed to a, what do we need to do so this young person continues to have what they need in order to drive? So it's a matter of balance in your environment. Do you all talk about these matters on a constant basis so that the issues are, are surfaced? So I, um, I would say that maybe amongst these agencies that happens and maybe under a hand, you know, with a handful of additional agencies, but in reality, when you've got the child protective system that is so overburdened, it's the last thing that is discussed normally. Now, maybe it's different where you all are, but you know, we've got for the first time in a decade, we've got case managers at, and we don't do foster care case management. Okay, it's the state and some other private agencies, but they're back up to 40 cases and God bless them. And, and child welfare workers turn an average of every 18 months, they're paid, you know, starting salary here in St. Louis is $32,000 a year, right? And, and people get into this work to be helpful. But if you literally can't, you know, swim, right? I mean, I don't know how you're supposed to stay above it. So I would say it's the ideal but not the norm at this point. And I don't know if you two disagree or, or, or not, Don and Becky. No, I absolutely agree. I think we, we have these standards, these ideals that we talk about, but in the real world, there is an influx of children with significant therapeutic issues right now that are they're coming into the system. There's a shortage of families who, who know how to deal with their needs, who have been trained how to deal with their needs. And it just creates a, a worst case scenario um, where, you know, I know some of these kids get um, their warehouse, even there, we are not able to find placement for them. Um, we have a system in Georgia, it's probably everywhere called uh, hoteling, where with these hard to place teenagers, where they, they've got really specific needs and, and it's, it would be wonderful if we had this unlimited list of foster families who were highly trained in all different types of issues. Um, but so what happens is these kids end up going in a hotel with um, a sitter and they stay there and they languish, their, their needs aren't getting met. They're basically just biding time until they can find an appropriate placement. So, I mean, it's definitely, the system is overwhelmed, just like you said, Melanie, and it's, um, I know there've been great strides the past five years with uh, Families First and different um, scenarios that are, that are in the right, on the right track, but with the influx of just the really, I don't know about y'all, but you guys, <laughs> but um, it's the, the numbers of children coming that are being referred to our agency with significant psychiatric behavioral issues um, it's, we haven't seen, I've been with this organization for 17 years. We have not seen this before. It, I was, um, it's, it's just like the microcosm of what's going on in the world, the drug abuse, um, violence, um, the breakdown of the family unit and inequities that are happening as well. So how do we make it better? I mean, th this is something that it's, I've seen these cycles go for the last decades, right? There are upticks and then some, sometimes things get a little bit better, but then there are upticks again. And it seems that if we're going to make the system better, we have to be functioning in a different way. Becky, you, you mentioned and Melanie, um, you mentioned, and I'm sure Don, you don't disagree that, that you know, when you're, when you're fighting a fire, it's very difficult to plan the architecture to ensure that buildings don't burn. Right at that point, there's a fire going on, and so we have an overwhelmed system. Is there a solution to this? Because we have a whole bunch of nonprofits struggling all across the country, and I can go to any town in America, and I can hear the exact same stories. So this is throughout the country. This is not a urban or rural issue, or a red state or a blue state issue, or a coastal versus inland issue. This is everywhere. How do we fix this? Because this is this is our future, right, Don? I mean, so I can mainly I can mainly speak for how we are working with young people again, eighteen until twenty-seven, and that is I'm going to go to your analogy of fighting a fire. Mm -hmm. If if you only you only have the fire department to fight the fire, you may only be able to do so much. If you have the whole community fighting the fire, then you have expanded your resources. So we serve about 800 and almost 900 youth every year, individual youth between 18 and 27. We 
We also have about 800 volunteers who are part of our community of support. We could not possibly do individualized uh, services and, and, and give that sort of sense of belonging if we have a staff of, of 40 to 800 people. But with those volunteers who become a consistent part of their support network, who, who recruit other people to also be part of that support network, suddenly we have this whole community that is working on this, not just our organization. And, and I think that is really the key is that, and, and I, I know there may be some disagreements about this, but we have so professionalized support that only the people who have some sort of degree can be there and be part of that support. And those people are gonna be doing what they can, but it's limited and it's also probably time-based where we have somebody who became a volunteer for a young person to help them with budgeting. And, and, and that person was at that young woman's wedding when she, when she got married and was, in, was there when she just bought her first home just last week. So that person is part of her, of her family going forward. And he has also connected her with other people to be supported in other ways. So it's, it's broadening the base and getting everyone involved, right? It being involved ourselves. We just finished a, a poll in which we, we asked first um, how many people who are attending, and it's a select group, um, had had contact with the foster care system. And 79% of attendees um, on Zoom uh, did. And then we, we completed a second poll, does the foster care system help or harm? 13% said help and the system works as it should, but 71% said it helps, but does not work as it should. And the remaining 17% uh, felt that it actually uh, creates harm. So- um, Let me just say one other thing about that. And, and I think this gets back to something that has been mentioned before. So the foster care system was designed to be a temporary thing, not something that people were in for 16 and 18 years. Right. So, so so if it was temporary, it would maybe be working as it should. It wasn't designed to do what it's supposed to be doing now. And so there's no way it can work because it wasn't designed to work that way. It wasn't designed for long-term. So, so you have to start from the beginning and say, what do we want to design? And going back to that old analogy of there's you know, children in, in, the, in the river, you have to both jump in and, and do what you can for those children. And you do also have to go back and see why they're in the in the water in the first place and help create stronger communities. And I think that's what we would all agree on so that it doesn't happen in the first place. And then oh. we want to help them get in so it doesn't re recur. Don, Becky, let's let's make Melanie the the head of state in the United States. So Melanie, <laughs> you're the president. We're going to have Senate and the Congress. <laughs> You can pass anything, right? You can bring the, the, the left side and the right side of your brain together and negotiate and come up with something. What do we do? What do we do in America? Well, let me build on something that Don said in talking about those informal supports, right? Don, so we've got, we call them like our, in our world, the formal supports and the informal supports. And formal supports go away when money goes away. So you're doing that with, with your young people, which is beautiful. And we do that with our kinship families, right? So we're not just, I always give like grandma works for Boeing, sits grandkids come live with her tomorrow, but she's gonna, she can retire in nine months. How do we make sure that she gets there, right? And so we're infusing those informal supports. Who's gonna bring lasagna over? Who's gonna take the kids to church on Wednesday? When the little one gets expelled from school, cause he does every other week, who's gonna go pick up that grandkid, right? So it, infusing those informal supports and really giving the power back to the individual and, and um, making sure that we're not telling them how they have to redefine their entire lives, but that we're listening. So we're coming back to that, that theme. But how, and, and Don, I vote for you because you know figuring out why the kids are getting in the river in the first place is really the first place to start in, in my opinion. And that is, we know uh, any EKC family has a program called uh, Family to Family. And in St. Louis City, in 2002, there were nearly 3,000 children in foster care. When Annie Casey's Family to Family came in and said, no, we're going to divert kids from entering foster care who shouldn't be here, that number dropped to 589. 
So the first step is to stop ripping babies away from their families who shouldn't be ripped away from their families. And if we can do that, I mean, we can, we could make change immediately, but, but we are a system that is set up um, in racism and classism. So it's going to take a while to change that, unfortunately. So, so we have three different ideas so far. One is the, the recourse to community, right? Volunteerism, creating this, this group. It's not a government uh, idea. It's really a community idea. How do we take care of people in our community? The second idea is the whole idea of, of let's do the upfront work to prevent um, people entering into foster care and also keeping those, those, uh, that experience as short as possible. And the third piece is, is really one of, of trying to deploy resources in a way that has the greatest impact on a, in a child center um, uh, sense. So meeting the child where their needs are providing wraparound support and counseling and, and those kinds of things that you raised, Becky. Um, Becky, if you were going to take over from Melanie, Melanie now has, has passed the torch and you're going to be um, the person who makes the decisions for this country, would, would there be other uh, changes that you would make to the system? I think so. I think that, um, and, and this is back in 2018, um, there was a law that was passed, the Families First Prevention Services Act, which I know y'all are all familiar with, but it would be providing more uh, wraparound services to the birth family, to um, parenting classes, um, drug abuse classes, um, just different things that we can do as a community to support those families and give them the tools and the resources that they need to keep those children in the home. So you, your whole idea is, is that uh, you're actually providing a whole range of counseling to the various players here in order to ameliorate this, this dislocation? Yes, counseling would be one of the services I would offer. There would be um, a whole spectrum of services, actually. I think also we could do more to um, promote equity with families that don't have, that have housing issues that don't have food, clothing, provide, make that a priority, as well as helping with um, just counseling, parenting classes. And then also there's a, a large majority of children who come into foster care, come in because they're because of drug abuse, parental drug abuse. So um, more resources towards that effort, I think would be a huge help to keeping kids out of the system in the first place. Um, we're going to uh, continue with Melanie and Don. We're going to give you the, the last word since we're uh, running out of time. I'd like to chat um, a, a little bit more about the whole idea of, of the foster care system being a symptom of inequity, uh, which you raised, uh, Melanie. Um, to what extent are, is, is the effect on children a downstream effect of poverty and trauma within community and so on? Because it seems to me that if, if, if you go with the thesis that, uh, that children being thrown into foster care um, is a downstream effect, then to stop that, you actually have to deal with some upstream causes. Was that what you were uh, indicating, Melanie, or did I misunderstand? Oh, um, yes. In a nutshell, yes. Of course, there's a ton to unpack there, but yes. So, so if children are sort of the... the the, the people who suffer from those upstream causes, what do you think the, the upstream actions that we could take that would reduce the amount of, of uh, neglect and, and uh, other uh, impacts that cause kids to end up in foster care? What do you think those, those big actions that could be taken in a place like St. Louis, Missouri? So um, the, you, the number one thing is um, making sure that children are not brought into foster care just because uh, a family is poor. And that happens all the time. So it's really a matter of attacking poverty in that, you know, in that case? Yep, yep. If you've got a 24-year-old Caucasian woman right out of school, well-meaning, and she's doing an investigation 
and it's in an area of St. Louis that maybe where there's poverty and there's violence and it's largely African American. I don't really think that that family is going to get necessarily a, a good look. I think there'll be a lot of assumptions, a lot of implicit bias. One of the things that's been tried in New York, and I'd love to see it, is called blind entry. And that is where you have um, the, the situation of a, a child potentially coming into care, but all identifying information is, is, re is redacted. And it's amazing that the, the turnaround that they've been able to make in New York. So that would just be an example of making sure that we've got bias removed from the system. So you're talking about the fact that the system itself needs to take into account the lived experience of the people who are providing the services. Yes, and I mean, there's just like so many things, you know, we could we could talk about this for days, but just the fact that we're finally talking about how our system is um, is not fair is a start because we weren't even talking about that until really the murder of Mr. Floyd. So cultural competency uh, is, is, is really needs to be embedded as if it is as strong a competency as finance competencies or casework competencies. There are cultural competencies that if they are not embedded into these organizations can result in really poor impacts for children. I guess, I guess that's your point, right? And do. And in other states, it's, you know, Native American children who are overrepresented in the population or our Latinx children who are overrepresented. So um, definitely all of our minority communities um, pay the price for our system that is not set up in an equitable manner. And Don, if you were going to make one ask of America, of all of us, what would that ask be? Well, again, I... I... I, the way things are set up right now is you have the system over here and then you have the community over there and the system is acting on the community. It's not that there's a community and the system is serving within that community to meet its needs. So I, I think it really goes back to the community approach. And I also just wanted to say that I described those adverse childhood experiences that the children are having. Their parents had those same adverse childhood experiences probably. And it, it makes no sense to, to say that we're willing to support these children for 18 years outside their family, but we don't give the same resources to the family that we would give for 18 years so that that family can have what they need. And then you stop the whole thing from happening in the first place. We are reluctant to give services to, to families who need them because for some reason, you know, that, that's socialism or whatever people say. But but on the back end, we create this whole uh, progression of, of negative impacts that cost so much more if you're just worried about cost. It costs so much more than if you had just gone into the front end. And we like to talk about it just in time, what it costs for somebody to be in prison once they don't get the support they need and they go into the criminal justice system for years versus giving somebody a hundredth of that same cost on the front end so that it doesn't happen in the first place. So I, I, I would ask America to look at this from a standpoint of community, writ large and small, and how can we act as a community to solve our problems? If we, if we acted more on the front end, we would reduce all kinds of social problems that we have uh, by, by treating families with compassion and helping to be supportive of them so they can they can be environments where people can thrive. I think the two things that I've, that I've taken from the, um, from the input that you've all provided to us is that this whole idea that there's a front end issue that is causing this, this manifestation that children are the victims of our inability to deal with that front end issue. Um, I think that that is such a powerful, powerful point. And it was expressed by you, Becky, by you, Melanie, by you, Don, in so many different ways, um, I think it's something that we we all should really uh, give some thought to. And the other the other piece is this whole idea of cultural competence. And cultural competence really uh, comes down. It's not a matter of of any one thing: race, religion, poverty. Um, but it is a the idea of of being centered in the child's experience, right? 
and, and trying to understand how do you create, to the extent that we all can do that, how do we create, create a parental caring, the kind of caring that we have in our nuclear families, but for children who, who need that? And thinking about relatives, your point, Becky, in terms of trying to uh, pair people with, with their relatives, and your point, Melanie, and yours, Don, the whole idea of, of trying to really respond to children as if, as if they were our own as a society. It's, it's just so important. Thank you so much for uh, helping us to understand just a little bit more about uh, your services around the country. Becky Davenport, Executive Director of Blue Mar Youth in Fayetteville, Georgia. Melanie Sheets, uh, Executive Director of the Foster and Adoptive Care Coalition in St. Louis, Missouri and Don Wells, Chief Empowerment Officer of Just in Time for Youth in San Diego. You've really given us a great view of, of the nation. Uh, thank you all attendees for coming in and for sharing your questions and uh, for your response to the polls. And on Thursday, we'll be talking about uh, food insecurity and food waste in the United States. So please, uh, please come again.